drowning in the will of the Almighty, is one of the greatest privileges that you and I have as Christians. To give ourselves so wholly to Him that we are immersed fully in His will. But sometimes it seems like knowing God's will is one of the most challenging parts of the Christian life. Have you ever cried out, Lord, I'd be happy to do your will if I just knew what it was? There was once a godly woman who was asked to travel to Europe during the summer to help the churches over there. And uh, at the time that she was asked to do this, she was not feeling well. She was working on several uh, important projects and she really did not want to travel. It was hot summer. She didn't like to travel in the summer. It was difficult for her, especially when she wasn't feeling well. But she wanted to do what God wanted her to do. Should she stay home and work on her writing projects? Or should she go to Europe and help out the churches there? So she prayed about it and she said, By day and by night my prayers ascended to heaven, that I might know the will of God and have perfect submission to it. Still, my way was not made clear. I had no special evidence that I was in the path of duty or that my prayers had been heard. And then later on she wrote, Although I had prayed for months that the Lord would make my path so plain that I would know that I was making no mistake, still I was obliged to say that God hangs a mist before my eyes. This woman, of course, was Ellen White. And Ellen White was given deep and powerful insights into many aspects of the Christian life. And yet she still felt at times that God hangs a mist before her eyes. If she felt that, my, my friends, you and I will feel the same way. No wonder George Truett once wrote, to know the will of God is the greatest knowledge. To find the will of God is the greatest discovery. And to do the will of God is the greatest achievement. In the Christian life, there are three types of choices. We have the white choices. Those are the choices that we know are good. We have the black choices, the bad ones. We know that we shouldn't be making those choices. But there's also a whole sea of these gray area choices. We don't know for sure what God's will is in them. Are they black? Are they white? How can we know? Ellen White had very good reasons for not wanting to travel to Europe. She was doing an important ministry there in her writing and also in her speaking appointments in that area. And of course, she was not feeling well. So she, she had a good reason for wanting to stay, but she also wanted to help the church in Europe. She had a good reason for wanting to go to Europe. So the choice was kind of hard for her to decide. You and I have all kinds of gray area choices, just like Ellen White did. We may want to know, for example, if we should take that new job or take that vacation at that particular time, or accept that leadership position in the church, or even buy a new refrigerator. We may want to know what kind of music we should listen to. We might want to know how to spend our time and how to spend our money. We may even want to know how to eat more healthfully. In a thousand different ways, we have lots of choices in our life, and not all of them are easy for us to know exactly what we need to do. <clears throat> Let me give you a practical example. When I first gave God my uh, diet, uh, he began to convict me in ways that I could improve that diet. And um, one of the things that began to come on my mind, a conviction, was about vinegar. When I would eat vinegary foods, I would think, is this really a healthy food to eat? And I wasn't sure. I didn't know. But I began to be convicted about it. And so I decided that I was going to try to find out more about vinegar and, and what its health properties are or, or what its harmful effects are. So I went on the internet. Of course, the internet knows everything. And if you ask the internet, um, vinegar is one of the healthiest foods you can eat. It's a cure-all for almost anything. <coughs> well, not being completely um, uh, clear about that, I decided to ask uh, Neil Nedley at camp meeting when I saw him once. And he said, no, 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 don't let vinegar near your stomach. Uh, at, the, at the time, he didn't have any research for me, but, I, but he said, you really don't want this stuff in your stomach. It's a, it's a preservative. It has harmful effects. And of course, I had already gone through the Bible, and there really isn't much in the Bible about vinegar, and Ellen White didn't have much to say about it. And what she did say wasn't very clear, so I really didn't know what to do. It's a gray area for me. 
You know, often when we talk about guidance, we quote this verse here, Isaiah 30, 21. Your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right or to the left. You know, that's what I want. I want an audible voice in my head saying, Mike, that's the way, go that way. But you know, that's never happened to me. Although I have longed for that and prayed for that even, it's never happened to me. I've never had that voice tell me which way to go. And I know that God can do that. And I know that some people have heard audible voices to guide them. God is completely able to do that. But I've always wondered, is there something wrong with me that I've never had that audible voice? Well, you know, I've studied this verse, and as I've studied it, I've come to the conclusion that this verse is not talking about God telling us which way to turn. In fact, whenever you see the words left and right in Scripture, it's usually a way you don't want to go. You want to stay straight. For example, Deuteronomy, be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Here's another one. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. This is talking about King Josiah. And he walked in the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. Here's one in Proverbs. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. So this verse, is, I don't believe that it's promising us an audible voice from God to tell us which way to turn. Instead, it's saying that the Holy Spirit will convict you to keep going straight. Stay on the straight and narrow. Don't turn to the left or to the right. That's what the Holy, uh, Holy Spirit's going to convict us to do. So there's three things that we should know about God's guidance. One is only God can do it. Only God has the data to be able to help us to make his choices, to know his will. If God doesn't show us his will, you and I are in trouble because only God can do it. The second thing we should know about it, Oh, except Jeremiah says, uh, I know, Lord, that man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. It's not possible for a man to direct his steps. Only God can do that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Only God can do it. That's the first thing we need to know about God's guidance. Only God can guide us. And the second thing that we should know about God's guidance is that he longs to do it. He wants to, to show us his will um, more than we can imagine. Obviously, he wants us to be as closely and carefully aligned to his will as possible. So God longs to guide us. That's good news. The Bible says, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. In Isaiah, we read, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way that you should go. You see, only God can do it, and God longs to do it. He will guide us. In Psalms, we read, who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way that he should choose. So, only God can guide us, Oh, God longs to guide us, but the third thing that we should know about God's guidance is that we have to let him, right? Only God can do it. No matter what it is in the Christian life, only God can do it, but we have to let him. One of the keys to knowing God's will is to be willing to do his will, to be submersed already in his will. There was uh, once two men talking about ministry, and... Um, one of the guys said, you know, I just was, don't feel called to minister in that way. And the other guy turned to him and smiled and says, are you sure that you're within calling distance? Are you sure that you're within calling distance? How about you and I? When God calls us, are we sure that we are within calling distance? You know, um, calling distance is a common problem, it turns out, in the end time Christian church. Jesus prescribes three cures for the church of Laodicea. And one of those is eye salve. He says, I advise from you to buy from me eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Revelation 3, 18. Why do we need that eye salve? Well, Ellen White says that the eye is the sensitive conscience, the inner light of the mind. Upon its correct view of things, the spiritual healthfulness of the whole soul 
and being depends. <laughs> it's important for us to know God's will, to be sensitive to God's will, to have a sensitive conscience. And so that ISAV helps correct our sensitive uh, conscience uh, problem that we have, the desensitization to God's will. Notice that the Bible says we must buy this. I advise you to buy from me this ISAP. How do we buy these three wonderful cures for Laodicea from God? What is the currency of heaven? Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, Jesus says in Revelation 3. Therefore, be zealous and what? Repent. And behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. This is how we buy the three cures of Revelation. Revelation 3. We repent and we open our lives wholly to God. Unreservedly, unresistingly, unrelentingly to, go, to God. We are told, says Christ, by renouncing your own self-sufficiency, giving up all things. However dear to you, you may buy the gold and raiment and ISAV so that you may see. My friends, surrender and repentance are the currency of heaven with which we buy the three cures of Laodicea that Jesus talks about in Revelation 3. Only God can guide us. God longs to do it, but we have to let him. How does God guide us? Well, he guides us in many ways. Here are some examples of biblical principles, the example and words of our godly friends, counsels of Ellen White, inspired Christian writers, opening and closing doors. In these ways and many other ways, God guides us. But there is another way that God often guides us that's not necessarily very well understood, and that is guilt. You know, um, when God convicts us, sometimes it's not comfortable for us. Sometimes we don't like it. It makes us feel a little bit guilty. But guilt can be a good thing. In God's hands, guilt can be a good thing. Unfortunately, for every good thing that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. So how can you tell between the godly guilt, the good guilt, and the false guilt that the devil wants to, um, to use on us? The difference is, godly guilt builds up and encourages Whereas the devil's guilt discourages, depresses. God, uh, the devil tries to push us so fast that we get overwhelmed. Whereas God works with us slowly, inexorably, patiently, without pushing us too fast, too far. God's convictions come in waves sometimes. He'll give you conviction and then he'll back off a little bit. And he'll give you another conviction and then slowly but surely he leads us to the point where we realize this is truly a conviction from him. And he teaches us his will. This... Um, happened with Martin Luther. Martin Luther um, was a legalist. He was a Catholic. He, he uh, was a strong uh, Christian. He wanted to do everything God's way, exactly God's way, and he, he believed that he had to earn his way into heaven by obeying God in everything. And um, once when he was um, in, a, in a monastery and he was torturing himself essentially, to try to earn his way into heaven, he read a Bible that was chained to the wall, and he learned about this concept called righteousness by faith. The just shall live by faith, the Bible says. All of a sudden, Martin Luther's eyes were open. He says, wow, I'm a legalist. The just shall live by faith. Well, he was uh, sent not too long after that on a commission to Rome. And as he was on his way, he had to stay at a convent, uh, a monastery on the way there, and he was sickened by the conduct of those monks. They were licentious, they were greedy, and uh, it, just, it actually make, made him sick. He was on his deathbed. But as he was laying there on his deathbed thinking, you know, what is happening to these Christians? These are the leaders of our church. Look at how greedy and licentious they are. He said, you know what? The just shall live by faith. And that gave him courage. He got up off his deathbed and he, he went on to Rome. When he got to Rome, one of the first things he wanted to do was he wanted to go to Pilate's staircase, which the Pope says, if you crawl up on, on your knees, kissing the floors as you go, that you can actually get repentance. You can get um, um, forgiven for your sins. Indulgences type of thing. And so Martin Luther wanted to do that. He wanted these indulgences. And so he went up on his knees. He was about halfway up or so. And all of a sudden, this, 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 the just shall live by faith, boomed in his mind. And this time it clicked, really clicked deep. 
This is the third time God had given this conviction. The just shall live by faith. He got up off his knees. He ran away in shame. He realized, that's not how you get repentance. The just shall live by faith. Davin who was writing the biography of Martin Luther, said this about Martin Luther's experience. He says, it is often necessary that a truth, in order to produce its due effect on the mind, must be repeatedly presented to it. That's what God's conviction, that godly guilt that God gives us, helps to do. He gives us a little bit of a push, and then he backs off a little bit. Then he gives us a little bit more of a push, and he backs off. He keeps on working with us slowly, inexorably. So how can we know God's will? Plead with God. God wants to, to show you his will. He can plead with God so that you will know his will. And don't resist him. Make sure that you're not resisting him in any way. Let God change your mind. Uh, C.S. Lewis once wrote, There are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those to whom God says, All right then, have it your own way. Which kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be the kind of person that says, Lord, thy will be done? Or do you want God to say, okay, have it your way, but you're asking for it? It's important to realize that there are ways that God guides us, but there are also ways that he does not guide us. Here are a couple ways that he does not guide us, through feelings. Feelings are based on circumstances a lot of times. Feelings can be based on how much sleep you got last night or what you ate for supper. Feelings are not reliable indicators of anything, <laughs> really. They're not reliable indicators of your love for God. They're not reliable indicators of your faith or his closeness or his forgiveness. Feelings are not designed to help us to know God's will. They are not signs or indicators of God's will. <clears throat> The second way that God does not guide us is through the actions and choices of others. Not everybody around us is spirit-controlled. You might have guessed that. If we live in Lake Laodicea and lukewarm area of the church, then we have to realize that a lot of those people around us are doing things that aren't necessarily aligned with God's will. So we can't look at others like our peers and our parents and even our pastors and say, okay, well, they do it, therefore it's okay for me to do it. These are not... Valid ways that God guides us. He guides us in many ways, but it's a personal experience for him to guide each one of us. So, what happens when God is silent on a matter? Like what happened to Ellen White. She wanted to know God's will. It was a gray area. She pled with God. She, she, she says, Lord, I don't want anything between me and you. I want your will to be done. And yet, she still seemed to have this veil uh, over her eyes. Why is God sometimes silent? when we ask him specifically to know his will? Well, there are several reasons. One reason is that God may have already spoken. He's already said what he wants us to do, maybe in his word or through the uh, conviction or whatever. He's already told us, and so we need to listen. Um, we can't say, okay, Lord, but seriously, which way should I go here? Abraham, when he was called to sacrifice his son, he had the same problem. He wanted confirmation. And he, he pled with the Lord, Lord, what should I do here? But God had already told him to go and sacrifice his son. We are told that in his doubt, this is talking about Abraham, in his doubt and anguish, he bowed upon the earth and prayed as he had never prayed before for some confirmation of the command if he must perform this terrible duty. And he went to the place where he had several times met the heavenly messengers, hoping to meet them again and receive some further direction. But none came to his relief. When God clearly tells us his will, we need to go and do it without trying to find necessarily confirmation. The second reason why God may seem silent sometimes is that we are not fulfilling the conditions. If we're not already obeying him in the things that he has shown us, he may not be willing to show us something else. There's a possibly fictitious story that I once heard that illustrates this well. This man wanted to lose weight and uh, the problem was he loved donuts. And so he wasn't sure if God wanted him to give up donuts or not. So he said, Lord, if when I go by the donut shop, there's no parking spaces there on my way to work, then I'll know that it's not your will for me to get donuts anymore. Well, guess what? Amazingly, supernaturally, it turned out it was God's will for him to keep eating donuts because every time he went past that donut shop, there was an empty parking space. 
Sometimes he had to drive around the block 20 or 30 minutes, but there was always a parking space at some point. My friends, if that's what we're doing, if we're trying to play games with God, if we're not fulfilling the conditions that God has given us, then he may remain silent when we ask him for further insight. Jesus says, uh, I mean, um, we, we find in Deuteronomy 28.2, God says, all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. That obedience to God, that spirit-inspired, love-motivated obedience is a prerequisite sometimes to fulfilling the conditions of having God guide us. Um, number three, God may be teaching us, he may be testing us, he may be increasing our faith, our trust in him. He may remain silent for a time to see if we continue to cling to him. In a cellar in Cologne, Germany, World War II, these words were written. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when I feel it not. I believe in God, even when he is silent. I believe in God, even when he is silent. God does that sometimes. He remains silent to test us, to test our faith. Are we going to cling to him? God gives us sufficient evidence, we are told, to enable us to accept the truth understandingly, but he does not propose to remove all occasion for doubt and unbelief. Should he do this, there would no longer be a necessity for the exercise of faith. We would be able to walk by sight. And sometimes God wants us to walk by faith. Trust him. Be patient. Don't run ahead of God. Wait on God. Let him show you his will. And then when he shows it to you, go that way. Don't run ahead. Don't lag behind. The fourth reason why God might be silent is that we are not ready to hear the answer. We may think we are. We may plead with God for, for more information on this subject. But he might say, like he said uh, to his disciples, Jesus said to his disciples, I have many more things to say to you but you cannot bear to hear them yet. So here again, be patient, be yoked to Christ, walking with him not too fast, not too slow, unchafingly attached to the almighty God, and he will show you. The fifth reason why God might be silent is that God may not wish to command us on this particular matter. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you have a garden. And it, the garden, the weeds are, are growing faster than you can take care of them. And you're busy and you're not having a time to do that. And so you say to your daughter, um, would you go out today and weed the garden for me? And she says, sure, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. She goes out, she weeds the garden, and she comes back and says, I've done it. And you're so happy. I mean, that's, that's great, isn't it? Pleased that she obeyed you. But isn't it even nicer if you have this garden that's overgrown with weeds and you don't even ask your daughter? And she goes out and she weeds the garden for you and she comes back and she says, man, I know you're so busy today and you haven't had the chance to look at the garden. So I went out and weeded it for you. Sometimes God wants us to do things just because we love him, just because out of the spontaneity of our hearts and our desire to please him. He doesn't want to command us in a matter. So these are some reasons why God may be silent. He's already spoken. We may not be fulfilling the conditions. He may be testing or teaching us. We may not be ready to understand what, he want, what we want uh, to know more about, or God may not wish to command us on this particular issue. So the question is, what do we do when we have to make a decision and God is silent? Well, first we should prayerfully consider, are any of these reasons why God may be silent? Are we resisting God's will? Are we fulfilling the conditions? Are we already obeying what we, what we know? Or is there some reason why God may not be able to get through to us? And if, like Ellen White, we still cannot seem to get an answer on the subject, there is a, um, a decision, I think, that we can always make that is the best possible decision in these particular circumstances. And that is to err on the side of healthy self-denial. In other words, if you have a gray area in your life and God seems silent and he hasn't told you anything, but you have to make a choice, Make the choice that goes the most against your sinful nature, against your selfish desires. Make the choice that's hardest to make. The self-denying choice, the healthy self-denying choice. A godly man once uh, wanted to know if it was God's will for him to go to the mission field. He'd gotten a call and uh, he 
prayed about it. He didn't get any particular word on the matter. So he said this. He said, if I am willing to go, God can prevent me. But if I refuse to go, God himself will not force me, will not force my will. So the thing to do is to make the, the choice that's hardest for us to make so that God can easily stop that. God can easily say to us, that's the wrong choice. Go this other way, the easier way, and that's easier for us to do. But if we choose the easy way, and then God wants us to go the hard way, it can be a little harder to make that decision later. That leads to our key phrase this morning. If all else fails, err on the side of healthy self-denial. If all else fails, err on the side of healthy self-denial. And that's what Ellen White did. She writes, she decided to, that uh, even though it was uh, hot and she wasn't feeling well and it was a long travel, she decided that she was going to go to Europe to help them out. She got on the train. She says, although I had prayed for months that the Lord would make my path so plain that I might uh, know that I was making no mistake, still I was obliged to say that God hangs a mist over my eyes. But when I had taken my seat in the cars, the assurance came that I was moving in accordance with the will of God. The sweet peace that God alone can give was imparted to me, and like a weary child, I found rest in Jesus. Ellen White decided to do the harder thing. It would have been more comfortable for her to stay in her home, to keep working on her books, to keep preaching in that area until she felt better, but she said, you know, uh, it's going to be a, a hardship to travel all the way to the Europe, but that would be the harder thing to do, and so I'm going to choose that way, and God blessed her for it. And that's what I did with this vinegar question. I had no particular guidance on this matter. It was still a gray area to me. But one thing I did know, I knew that I enjoyed vinegar. And I knew that taking it out of my diet would be self-denying. And so I said, okay, I'm going to err on the side of self-denial. Do the thing that's hardest for me to do. And if later on I find out that vinegar is good for me and that God wants to add it back into my diet, no problem. It'll be easy to do. You know what happened? It's really interesting. After a few weeks of not uh, eating vinegar and vinegary products like uh, uh, ketchup and mustard and all those kind of things, I began to realize that other foods that I used to eat that weren't very healthy for me, like the uh, deep fat fried foods, I wasn't, I wasn't enjoying very much anymore because I didn't have my ketchup. I didn't have my mayonnaise. I didn't have my, my uh, mustard. And so I wasn't enjoying them as much. And so I actually stopped eating them uh, all as well. And I have not missed vinegar, even in salads. I can make a very good salad dressing with just um, olive oil, a little bit of lemon juice, and some herbs. So I have not missed vinegar, and the more I stayed away from it, the more I am convinced that that was the right choice for me to make. And I praise God for that. So the Christian life is full of choices. Good choices, ones that we know are God's choices. Black choices, the ones we know are not God's choices. And the gray areas. And by God's grace, he can help those gray areas questions get into the white or black category. He can teach us where they go. When we are fully surrendered to Jesus, we can have the confidence that whatever it takes, God will get through to us. God will supernaturally guide us without trampling our free will. We can be sure that God is going to guide us. He longs to do it. He will do it. The amazing power of God is not that he gives us an audible voice to tell us to turn one way or the other. I think the most amazing power of God is revealed when he is able to get us to do his will without trampling on our free will. Somehow, inexorably, he gets us to where he wants us to be without trampling on our free will. And that, to me, is a wonderful thing. But because we do have a free will, we can resist God. We can. We can easily resist God. And that's why it's so important, if we want to know God's will, to be surrendered to his will. To be willing to do what God wants us to do in every aspect of our life all the time. And then we can know without a shadow of a doubt that God will succeed in guiding us. By God's grace, we can know God's will. We can be fully immersed with him in the center of his will, abiding with him in the center of his will. Prayerfully seek to know God's will. Fulfill the conditions. Be patient. Wait for God to reveal himself. Don't run ahead. 
If you don't have to make a decision right away, put it off as long as possible until you have to make it. But let God give you some time to, um, to teach you, to show you, reveal his will to you. Wait on God. And if all else fails, err on the side of self-denial. Err on the side of the, the choice that's hardest to make for our natural self. And God will bless that. My friends, it is a true privilege to be immersed in the will of God, to know that God will guide us, to know that we don't have to lean on our own understanding, that in all our ways we can acknowledge Him as Lord and Master of our life, and that He will succeed in guiding us. He will succeed in aligning us to His perfect will, and we will enjoy the blessing of that for eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to know your will. What a privilege it is to align our lives with your will, Father, unreservedly, unresistingly, unrelentingly. Thank you for that privilege. I pray that you will help us, Father, to do whatever it takes to let you be Lord and Master of our life, to let you show us what your will is, to let you in, to give us the insights that we need, the sensitive conscience that will help us to uh, make your choices in every area of our life, all the time. Thank you for these blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.